is uh, Bob Westervelt, and today I'm actually going to introduce myself. <laughs> but uh, for the sake of to rescue you from me, I won't give a bio or anything like that. Uh, but I'm the director of the Science and Technology Center uh, here, uh, along with uh, Gary Harris at Howard University and Ray Ashuri uh, at MIT and Carolyn Alpert at Museum of Science, Boston. The talk that I'm going to give today is different than the talk I gave for a couple of years before. That was associated with getting the money the first time, okay, the first five years. Uh, in order to get the next five years, after three years, they ask you to go ahead. And uh, so I'll be, we've gone through a procedure which is actually, it was a lot of fun, a lot of work, took about a full year to go through it to decide what we were going to decide to do in the next five years. Uh, and it's entirely quantum. I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, and uh, that's what I'll describe today. So this is, uh, as I said, a bit different. I'll start out with an introduction to uh, what we mean by quantum materials, but I'll make that sort of brief and then get on to describe the kind of systems that we're developing. This gives a picture of the first, uh, where's my, first uh, few talks. And uh, the talks will be given here again Thursdays, 4 to 5, uh, with cookies and coffee. Uh, and here's me as the introduction. The following four talks are given by the new uh, leaders of the four research projects uh, in the center. Uh, and so this is both for people inside the center, because we just submitted the proposal itself maybe two weeks ago, uh, so that everybody can see what's in there and what the plans are. Uh, and then also for people outside the center so they can find out what we're about. Um, each talk is going to be live streamed so that people uh, who are in Howard University or MIT or Acapulco or wherever uh, can actually see it in real time. Uh, also, Harvard has been very nice in that they put the, uh, we have our own YouTube uh, channel. Uh, and then we uh, put each lecture up as a series of slides with voiceover on YouTube. And so that they're able for people miss that or have some other obligation, they can see them. Uh, the seminar series is also available as a course called Engineering Sciences uh, 294. And a number of students uh, signed up in the fall. Uh, the course is a very simple course that is uh, it's pass fail. And to pass, the requirement is that you show up for the good majority of the talks and then uh, sign in at the front. Uh, but that there's no homework and no you know, final exam or, or things like that. But it's meant to give you a, an exposure of uh, some current research topics and, and what people are, are thinking about. And so if you're interested in the course and haven't uh, signed up yet, uh, please put your name uh, and email down at the bottom. Uh, before you take off. The, uh, after hearing from the four uh, research areas, we're going to have external speakers from different places as we did last term uh, and run this as a regular quantum materials and devices uh, seminar uh, series. And we've got some excellent people lined up and so I think it should be sort of nice. Okay, and so what do I mean by quantum engineering? Uh, quantum engineering actually is a new uh, driver for the School of Engineering Sciences uh, at Harvard. The idea is that the quantum physics, which is done in the physics department, uh, is uh, sort of forward looking and very physics-y. Some of these ideas have come along far enough that if you want to make quantum uh, sensors or quantum communication or quantum computer, it actually pulls into an engineering aspect. It is how do you hook all of these things together, get them all work at the same time, and get it to do something useful. Uh, this is something that Frank Doyle, the dean, has uh, signed on to and uh, will give people inside C's as well as the division and chemistry uh, a target of what to do. And uh, here's the, the sales pitch for it in sort of a simple way. I made one of these uh, diagrams where you have a size scale on the left, and here's the size of current, uh, say, 22 nanometer uh, CMOS. Maybe we're at 14 nanometer now, but this is about where the electronics industry is. Um, 
and uh, that's at about 10 nanometers. If you do a particle in a box energy computation for electrons, it turns out that that's about uh, uh, one milli electron volt, and that's only about 10 degrees Kelvin. So these things at room temperature are really classical, okay? And if you talk to people at Intel or someplace, they have a total ball bearing view of the operation of the machines. And of course, it's wonderfully powerful, and it's what's giving this show, but that's kind of the way it operates. And it turns out that silicon is not happy if you make it much thinner. It leaks electricity. Uh, it doesn't like to be in single layers very much, and it's just not aimed to go a whole lot smaller than that. Um, and here is room temperature at 300 degrees Kelvin. Uh, if we go down to, say, one nanometer, that's about 10 atomic layers, uh, then we get into layered materials, stacks, van der Waal stacks of uh, atomic layers. And if you go all the way down to an angstrom, or a tenth of a nanometer, then you can have a single uh, sheet of graphene. And I put a hydrogen atom uh, on here again for sort of a size scale. It's interesting that until about a decade ago, people thought these atomic layer materials were thermodynamically unstable, graphene in particular, and that it would be entropically so unhappy in being a perfect flat sheet that it would just crumple up and sort of go away. And good old Geim, Scotch tape, it didn't blow up and go away. It's easy. Uh, and it turns out to be, in, in fact, incredibly strong and robust and just the kind of material that you would like to make uh, things out of. And it's not just uh, graphene. It's things like uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, uh, things like MOS2, uh, also uh, pull apart in van der Waals layers. And you can also pull them apart with uh, Scotch tape and to make, and they behave very well in single layers and make transistors and all of that. And for some reason, people just didn't do this earlier. The, the, uh, the band structure for graphene was calculated correctly before I was born, but nobody actually, you know, anyway. Uh, and, uh, but what happens then is that the energy scale goes to be much greater than room temperature. And so this means that if you want to do a quantum mechanical experiment in science or you want to make a device which is entirely quantum mechanical, uh, you can make it operate at room temperature using these devices. And this is a big deal because you don't need a dilution refrigerator that costs half a million dollars. You can put it in a shoebox and it'll operate just as, as well. The other thing that happens, if you look at these energy scales, uh, they match on to the optical energy scale. And so if people want to make, it, use light to actually transmit information uh, and to use light as a way of hooking things together, it's sort of a natural uh, match. And things like color centers in diamond, where you have single color centers uh, interacting with visible light, is a natural way to do it. And so it hooks on to a whole other field, which has been very active and powerful, and that's uh, photonics. Any questions? About, I, actually, you can ask me anything that you want. I, I, I'm an old guy. I've seen a lot, and so I can uh, pretty much answer whatever. No? Yeah. Okay, so let me go on with the pitch. And what happens is a bit like high-energy physics. Uh, in a vacuum, we're used to thinking about certain particles that we use, like an electron, a photon, an atom. And if you want to manipulate information or make something work, that's, that's what you've got to go with. And you can start making things like vacuum tubes. Actually, i old enough that I first learned electronics in vacuum tubes. Okay, so I actually know how vacuum tubes work. Um, but if you go into a solid, a crystal like silicon or something like that, things change, but not so much. Uh, it turns out you get block waves and you get electrons and holes. Uh, but they move around, but they still have an effective mass. And the mass has a different number, but you can still think of silicon with PDs and everything is good. And the light slows down a bit because the index refraction, but you still have photons. And you have new things like phonons, which are quanta of sound. But this part of it uh, we understand very well. But it's a bit like the, the ocean where this is just off the coast of California, you see these little critters swimming around. You can eat them for dinner and all of that. Um, but when you go really deep down to these atomic plane scales, you have quantum materials where the particles are different. 
and they have very different properties. Uh, for example, a graphene uh, has no mass. It moves like a photon at a constant speed, except it's a, a fermion. And it has no energy gap. They're very different. In topological insulators, they have edge states that look like the quantum Hall effect, except there's no magnetic field. And you can't stop them. They keep going in a circle forever. And a uh, nitrogen vacancy center in diamond can store a qubit of information at room temperature, just one spin. And it's perfectly happy. And see, these are very transformatively uh, different capabilities than, than what you see with uh, conventional materials. And so the vision of these is to create atomic scale devices and systems uh, for quantum sensors. This we've already done, and it's sort of the easiest and first thing to do. But then also quantum communications. Uh, Marco Lanchar is going to be talking about quantum networks uh, next week. And then quantum computers. And I'll say a bit about the future of this. So we want to redo everything that is done currently in the silicon technology uh, only to redo it in a quantum sense for a different set of applications. And to do that, we're going to deal with the quantum materials that I introduced. And I'll say briefly a bit about them in case you don't know, but I expect most of you already do know a fair amount of them, and then get on to the application. So atomic layers, graphene, boron nitride, molydisulfide uh, for devices. Topological insulators for edge states is how you wire things together. Uh, and then nitrogen vacancy center uh, diamond for both quantum sensors and then for quantum memory for qubits. And what about quantum computing? Back, uh, Carol Livermore and Fred Waugh back in, um, really I'm getting old, 19, 95 and 1996 were some of the first to make double and triple quantum dots as an artificial molecule using gallium arsenide uh, dots that we uh, wired together or with tunneling. And Bert Halperin worked out the theory of that. Uh, and we did it, we got it to work for, you know, 100 electrons per dot. Uh, but then a variety of people moved that down to a single electron per dot, and De Vincenzo and Loss said you can actually make a quantum computer this way. And that really started up uh, a new field. Um, but then there was sort of an over rush in DARPA in about the year 2000 to build a quantum computer in five years that would decrypt the, you know, Putin's uh, script. And uh, of course, Putin just sends it to our guy now, so we don't have, anyway. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, I should watch out, Um <laughs> But, uh, but, they, they put too much of a hurry on to it. Uh, and then the quantum computing really didn't happen in just 10 years like that. And then some people said, well, you know, this is really going to take a long time. That doesn't matter. But so what's happened in the meantime is the uh, science has moved ahead quite a bit. Uh, the technology has moved ahead quite a bit. Uh, and I think the view now is the first person who really has, say, a quantum computer with a million qubits in it, uh, will we'll really be able to decrypt the other people's script, and they'll be able to make a Google site where you could look at anything that goes on in Russia or China or Finland or wherever you want to go. And that's viewed as being a really major uh, achievement, and something if it takes 20 years is perfectly fine. It's better to be the person that does it in 20 years as opposed to the person that in 25, uh, I think is more the view. And so Google, for example, has taken John Martinez, who is one of the best superconducting uh, qubit uh, people, and bought him off. I think he probably doubled his salary, uh, and then created a company in back of uh, Santa Barbara, uh, where he is making uh, quantum computers out of uh, superconducting qubits. And he has his own Martinez law, where the number of qubits is reliably doubling every year, which is great. The thing is, he's got 10 qubits, and then you take the log 2 of 10 to the 6 over 10 to the 10, and you get about 20 years, but it's good. And he can actually do it. He's one of the best people in the world. And also, Intel has given 50 million to Delft, who, again, I think for uh, Josephson Junction once, 
But uh, Delft is one of the best places in the world for this kind of thing. And so that the big companies are really putting significant uh, tens of millions of dollars anyway into this in order to discover what happens. If you look at regular computers, this is a picture of uh, a big, uh, this is a little bit out of date now, but uh, a 16 petaflop IBM computer. What happens is the clock speed is stuck at a gigahertz, the same as my lovely Mac here, and it will never increase in the future. And so if you want to make a big computer, you have to have millions of cores like this. And we've already seen what happens. They all turn into Google or to Microsoft Cloud or something like that. And for that purpose, it's perfectly fine, and it will be there forever, I think. But for solving other kind of problems like we're talking about, it just can't do it. And if Martinez were successful 20 years from now, his computer would be about this big. But it would actually be able to decrypt uh, cryptography. And the thing that uh, I like is that quantum cal, if you had quantum commun communications where you can actually send qubits uh, uh, through space or through optical fibers anyway, uh, that uh, Marco Lanchar is going to talk about next week, then you would have a quantum cloud where you could just hook up to a, a larger quantum computer somewhere else and, and do your thing. So that's uh, where we're headed. Any questions about that? Or? No. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's good. I think it's blue wave is, is, is uh, people claim to be a quantum computer, but I'm not really sure. What does that fit into this? this uh, D wave dissipates energy to find a solution. It is a quantum computer. I saw a talk, they, in order to build it, it has a lot of squids. And what's impressive is they bought a 300 nanometer uh, CMOS uh, fab, and then guys went in there and converted it over to making JJs reliably. And whoever did that is, you know, that's really a number one quality. But the way that it works, it actually has potential wells that is relaxing in order to find a solution. And so that that's actually dissipative. It's not coherent like a regular. So the good part is that it works fairly soon. The bad part is it doesn't solve a problem that my iPhone, you know, won't solve. I'm not the biggest fan, but Google also bought D-Wave, and I think they're thinking of making them bigger, which they could, and then doing sort of Google optimization and searching, and it may work very well for them. Okay. Other questions? Or? Okay, um, so here I'll go quickly through the graphene part if people uh, haven't seen this before. Uh, but graphene is this hexagonal lattice and it has a basis of, you know, red, two types of atoms, the red and the, the green. And remarkably, the band structure uh, has these cones, this is K and energy, uh, what are called Dirac points. Uh, where the particles have a constant speed and no band gap. They also are able to go through potential barriers uh, very quickly by taking an electron and it turns into a hole and then back into an electron. So they actually conduct extremely well and they have very long mean free paths. And so this created a lot of excitement over the past dozen uh, years. This is a picture that uh, Wei Li Wang uh, made while he was a postdoc with me. And this was actually done at Berkeley. I would like to say that it's done in CNS. Uh, but with uh, atomic resolution TEM. And if you look, it shows you how tough the graphene is. And there's a couple uh, carbon chains here. It's literally one carbon atom after the other after the other. And the carbon atoms stick together so strongly that they're incredibly strong because this is getting whacked by 80 keV electrons to image it, it still holds tight. And if my computer works, we can show you an image. It's looking promising. Look at the middle. Select, grant access. Yes, very close. There it goes. And if you look at the middle, see it's wobbling around and then finally gets blown away. And this is one reason like Intel uh, likes Graphene is it's extraordinarily tough. You can actually stretch it 20% before it breaks and extraordinarily strong. And if you take even one chain of atoms, it still hangs together while it's being blasted by 
very energetic uh, electron. Another type is topological uh, insulators, uh, and I'll give a brief intro to this. And these were theoretically invented about 10 years ago. I'd never thought of such a thing as an experimentalist, uh, and then experimentally proved later. And it turns out if you have a very lo large spin orbit coupling, spin orbit coupling's been known for a long time, but people didn't think it all the way through, that if you're on uh, a nucleus, an electron is going around the nucleus, uh, that's fine. But you can think if you're riding on the electron, the nucleus is going around in a current loop about it. And so that creates a magnetic field on the electron, and that's the spin orbit coupling. Normally, this is a relatively small effect, but if you go to heavy elements where the electrons are moving really fast, uh, then it turns out to be bigger, actually, than the band gap. And this creates a very unusual situation where the electrons find themselves in a very strong magnetic field, even though there's no external magnet. And so what happens if you have a two-dimensional system, it looks like a quantum hall system where Nothing is conducting in the inside. Things just go around in circles. But on the uh, edge states, you can either have the red ones with one spin direction that go counterclockwise, or the blue ones that go clockwise. And they're topologically protected. A quantum Hall effect is, too, in the sense that you, ca you can break the sample, and you won't change that edge state. It'll just follow the new edge. And so if you want to send qubits of information from one place, to another, this is exactly what people want to see. And so I, for the Museum of Science, um, I have my commercial. And like I said, I did try to find a guy in red pants and a guy in blue pants, but didn't succeed. Uh, but you can prove this with the woman in uh, red. If you put your left hand on the wall and then start walking, if I do this, I'll go counterclockwise or in the room, and I can close my eyes, and I'll still get there. You can change the shape of the room, I'll still get there. Whereas if I took my right hand, I'll go the other way around. And so it's a simple but sort of very, very robust way to understand what's going on. This is a new and slightly crazy field in that the theory is very important because people really don't know yet what's possible. And the theorists are kind of guiding uh, what the future might look like. And then last one is very popular. There's a secret location where my wife and I get uh, jewelry in um, San Francisco area, which is inside an old aircraft carrier. And the really low-end jewelers go there. Turns out they don't like jewels. I once got a beautiful, uh, excuse me, don't like uh, pearls. I got a beautiful pearl necklace for Dupec that cost $5. You know. It turns out pearl, you can test it. You put it on your tooth when they're not looking, and you go like this. And if it feels smooth, that's plastic, and you don't want that. But if it goes grabby, 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 then you've got a bit of bone, and then you're in, in good shape. And they also sell diamonds. It turns out the cheapest type of diamond is, has nitrogen in it, and this kind of yellowy shape. The one, if you put boron in, though, it's quite pretty. And the Hope Diamond has uh, got boron in it. And these are color centers. It's uh, the nitrogen atom is right next to a vacancy, but it's not near anything else. And so the diamond just holds that one color center just by itself. It's like a frozen atom in space uh, and allows you to use it. And the diamond kind of drops out of the picture. And this shows what that looks like in the lattice. Here's nitrogen. It's a little bit bigger than carbon, and so it needs this empty spot right next to it. Uh, and if you look at the it turns out you can both write uh, qubits and then read them optically. If you come in with circularly polarized light, you can actually write it from a 0 to a 1 spin state. And you can read it out by putting in green light and looking at the amount of red light that comes back. And that the answer will depend uh, on whether what spin state it's in. The remarkable thing is that the coherence time for this is a few milliseconds at room temperature. And furthermore, you think diamond's expensive, but the first experiments were done on diamond polishing powder, which is not very expensive. So you have to pick out the right ones and then go ahead. And so this has had, again, a transformative effect. It's become a really uh, a very exciting new field. And Harvard is number one in the 
world in terms of the number of publications and so what's happening. And uh, Marco Lanchar uh, has been developing the field of diamond photonics. This is where you start with a single crystal of diamond, and then you go down and CNS and carve it up with reactive ion etchers uh, and the like to actually make photonic systems. And this is a picture of a resonator, ball diamond. Here it's photonic, so there's a reflector like a blag, rag reflector on both sides. And then uh, one of these uh, Lipson uh, type resonators here has an NV center right in the middle. And so if you look at the light emitted, you can see the NV center here. If you look at the correlation, uh, it never emits two photons at the same time because one electron goes into one photon. And then you can see the end of the resonator here. Okay, and so, um, the, yeah, go ahead. You text the diamond and uh, silicon. Which yeah. The diamond seems to be very popular. But I could maybe imagine that maybe the other material that might be of interest. Sure. I don't hear anything about that. So silicon carbide, um, Evelyn, who is looking at that, and also at Howard. Uh, that's another hard material that looks promising. And it has color centers very much the way that uh, diamond does. The truth is, the reason why people are looking at nitrogen is it's simply the most common color <laughs> center in diamond. And the whole field is a very early stage. Uh, and I think that looking at alternative color centers in different materials, too, I think it's going to get better. It's that like when I was. Uh, your age, then at Berkeley, then color centers to make lasers was a big deal because the Ruby laser was 1963 and it worked. You know, people said, whoa. Uh, but they really didn't know what the right color centers were. So there was a lot of research trying to figure it out. By now, they do know. But I think this is going to change you know, a lot in the next One that looks promising that I'll show you is a silicon vacancy uh, center or something that. Uh, people are looking at it in both Howard and uh, here. And the silicon has two vacancies, one on either side. And the beauty is it doesn't couple the phonons very well because it doesn't have a dipole moment for string. It's a centricondrical. And so it, it has a much better line shape. So people are just really getting, you know, getting uh, going. Other questions? Okay, so here's the system, and this again I made for the Museum of Science for like little kids, so it's a bit oversimplified. But the point is that we have to sort of wire things together. And how do these materials matter? Well, there's a, a source of uh, spins, if you like. The spin is really what's carrying the information for us. Uh, then you have to have a switch where you make it go one place or the other. Uh, graphene or these transition metal dyed chalcogenides are sort of natural materials to do that. Uh, you have to have a channel that it can flow in, and that could be, uh, for the diamond, it could be an optical fiber that's carrying a photon. Uh, if you go solid state, it could be an edge state on a topological insulator like this. And then you need some way to save it for a little while, and the color centers uh, in diamond right now are the ones that do that, where you can let it sit somewhere uh, for a bit. And what the stage that we're in now is to figure out how to wire things together so they do something useful, then we'll all be rich at some time in the distant future when this all uh, comes to be. In order to make this work, you really need a, a center. And uh, the, the point is that you have kind of a cycle that has to uh, take place. And then first, you have new materials that you just don't buy from anybody. You have to know a grower and then work with them pretty closely. Uh, and then they grow a sample. This is a picture of Jenny Hoffman's uh, MBE machine here. Uh, and then you uh, take a look and first see what the material looks like. Is it really thought what you thought it was? And uh, we have excellent electron microscopes and characterization in the Center for Nanoscale Systems to do that. And then you make a device out of it and then see what the device looks like. And what almost always happens is that it does, <laughs> doesn't work on the first try. Matter of fact, it works on the third try, you're really lucky. And it works on the fifth try, your luck is still pretty good. 
uh, they work, and then you get a PhD, and then next graduate student starts up and starts this process. But to make this go, you really have to mix up uh, theorists, and this is a great moment here, uh, growers, uh, device makers, uh, device uh, you know, characterizers, and uh, mo you know, nobody knows all of that. And so having a center where uh, people work together is really a, an essential point. So let me talk about the research areas. And again, it was about a year of, you know, uh, brainstorming and sessions about how to do things went, went into this. And we came up with uh, four, uh, and all led by very no, well-known people. Uh, we have novel van der Waal heterostructures, and Philip Kim, uh, famous for graphene and, you know, TMDs and the like, is the leader of that. And this, Ken, is aimed sort of at quantum devices and sensors. Um, the next one is discovery of new topological crystals uh, that's led by Joe Chikelsky, a, a grower at MIT. Uh, Liang Fu is a well-known theorist. He's one of the founders of the field of topological insulators, works at um, MIT. And the nice thing about Liang is it, he's very clear. You know, it's nice. You can actually understand what he says, although he's totally abstract. So he will invent a new crystal, uh, but he won't know what the elements are in this crystal. You know, it's sort of at that level. But that's sort of what you want. Uh, but then we talk to other people who are more practical who come up with the elements, and then Joe grows it, uh, and then we go from there. And so this is to really push the boundaries of topological crystals. It's saying that topological insulator is just beginning, not the end, that there are more things like this. Uh, in order to make a quantum computer, you would really like to have topologically protected qubits. The big killer in a quantum computer is incoherence. And if it's just a linear system where you're, you shake it a little bit, it becomes incoherent, this is bad. But if you have something that's like an edge state where you can break the sample in half and the edge state is still rolling, it's good. And so you need some way to make uh, topologically uh, protected qubits, and Amir Yacobi uh, is leading that section. And the uh, final one is uh, how do you make a quantum network with these solid state quantum emitters that NV centers or silicon vacancies or whatnot. And that's a mix of the physics but a lot of this is really aimed at what color center, is the question you're asking, what color center do you use, where do you put it, how do you make the sample, how do you couple them together, uh, and that kind of uh, question. And so I'm going to spend um, some time uh, talking about each one of these. The people that we have uh, involved are really an outstanding uh, group. When we first got the uh, money, the panel said, why should we give you the money? Which is, you know, if you ever do this, that's a very logical question for somebody to ask you. You know, so you better have a good answer. And so then uh, Pablo Jurio Herrero actually looked up who are the most cited schools in these three materials. In Diamond, Harvard is by far ahead of everywhere else in the world. In uh, graphene, actually MIT and Harvard put together a number one, okay? Uh, and if you look at top topological insulators were number two, and Stanford wins that. But that's why it says we, you know, we should take the money. Um, and so that actually worked with the panel, and they thought it was reasonable. Uh, and uh, that same comment uh, works very well. We really have an outstanding group. We have a lot of theorists who work pretty closely with the experimentalists in order to uh, keep us guided on the right path. Uh, and then other people who are sort of expert device makers, expert growers, electron microscopy, and, and the like. The idea, again, is to make a whole community of people getting to know each other uh, that's broader than just the core universities. Uh, and so in the public outreach, we work pretty closely with the Museum of Science. Uh, and they know here, there, where, how do you communicate science with a public audience, a bunch of 14-year-old kids that don't know any technical words, and how can we do that? And I think the students enjoy, uh, you know, finding out how to do that a, a lot. And then we work with the Innovation Lab at Harvard about how do we think about business, uh, what kind of ideas would actually make sense, how can we get in touch with uh, business. 
Uh, we have a broader uh, set of the college network. It's interesting that all of my parents and grandparents were uh, musicians, and I was supposed to be a musician. And it was a great disappointment that first I didn't learn how to play the piano, which is how we made money. We, we were poor when I was a kid, and that was a source of cash. And they paid us, paid us in asparagus. Can you imagine those South Jersey, you know, tomatoes? And then we'd eat the tomatoes and asparagus, and we stayed alive, and it was good. Um, and then uh, uh, I, since I failed miserably at that, and the trumpet I tried, and then I tried the tuba, and I actually liked the tuba, and they took it away from me. And that was the end of my career, and so I had to switch fields. But uh, in looking at two- and four-year colleges, uh, they don't have the kind of facilities we do at the universities, but they're very bright students and uh, very uh, good to get them involved. And so we have a college network where they can spend time uh, at the universities, both during the academic year on uh, independent study or during the whole summer actually working on a research project in a group where they can actually publish papers and move ahead. We're broadening this out to other universities, too, with quantum partners, where if you know somebody at Berkeley or Santa Barbara uh, that wants to come and work with you for a month or so, we can support that kind of thing. So let me talk a bit about the uh, fields. And this is a graphic uh, for uh, the novel Van der Waals uh, heterostructures. And he's showing this sort of developmental uh, loop that I mentioned before about controlled growth and chemical modification, theory and modeling, making devices out of it, uh, and then new tools to actually look at how these behave. At MIT, uh, Jing Kong is one of the best uh, growers of uh, these materials in the world, and she's very patient and nice and uh, has, has ways. They can actually take the mascot of MIT and pattern it in a single atomic layer and grow graphene right next to a TMD material, and the mascot smiling at you right in the middle. I was very impressed by that. They have particular, uh, uh, not surfactants, but what would you call it? It's like a catalyst molecule that allows them to actually do that. Uh, and then it, we have facilities, excellent facilities, to go about this. And Philip himself is perhaps one of the best device people. Uh, he knows a lot of tricks about how do you actually make things. This shows some recent achievements. Uh, in graphene, the original material, they say it's good, but it's not that great because it never stops conducting. And then how do you get channels where you know where the electrons go? And so what people are doing is making hybrids uh, where you would take uh, graphene and connect it to a superconductor, for example, and end up with proximity superconducting graphene. And Monica uh, Allen uh, actually did an experiment like that where they had a Josephson junction with a channel that was made out of graphene. Uh, and in doing that, you can look at the JJ characteristics and do a kind of interferometry uh, as you put a magnetic field on to actually figure out what the spatial distribution is. And this is what she found out is you can actually uh, form edge states uh, along this where the current is just going down the sides of the graphene and it begins to give you a way to uh, actually say we're going to put the electrons along that edge and do it by hooking in a superconductor. In uh, Philips Kim group, there was another experiment going, is if you had, say, a quantum computer going and you want to transmit the qubits from one place to another, how could you do it? And again, it starts in graphene, but it's not that simple. You take a superconductor and you put a simple layer here, and there's something that's called Andre of scattering, where you can take a Cooper pair and it goes into a normal metal, and it uh, spits into an electron and hole going in opposite directions. And what they did is to make a really thin layer of superconductor so that your electron and hole can actually go all the way through the superconductor. And by doing that, you end up with a hole channel going along one edge of the graphene and then an electron channel uh, going along the other end. And it's another way to mix in some superconductivity to give you edge states in graphene that are carrying information in the way that you want to do it. You can ask me. Questions if you want. 
Um, there's another one that's more practical from uh, Jing Kong, Palacios, and Pablo at MIT, and that's to make a, a photo detector in graphene. And graphene's cantankerous, and it doesn't like to be a regular photo detector, but it makes a good thermopile, uh, generates thermal electricity if you put it in infrared light. And so this shows, this one's gotten a lot of attention from the more industrial people. And this shows a suspended piece of graphene device, a few microns. And being that they're from MIT, you know, you can forgive them for uh, putting MIT as being the pattern that they actually uh, image. And the kind of noise uh, temperature you get is about a tenth of a degree Kelvin, which is actually typical of an expensive bolometer that you would pay real money for. And the fact that you can make this in a small device is, is pretty uh, useful. In the topological crystals, the angle there is how do we go from Liang Fu, because I, I love him because he explains it and I actually understand it, but then I, how do I build it? And then we start. And uh, so he's working, you have an idea for new behavior that didn't previously exist. And it turns out Alana Sparaguzic in chemistry here is sort of a brilliant chemist who can actually look at databases of different materials to pick out the runs that have the right properties that Liang is doing. And so this shows this database sort of being Googled down into the very materials that we want to grow. And then Joe Chikelsky has an MBE machine, works, so does uh, Jenny Hoffman, so does Modera, and Gedick works closely with them to actually grow these new materials. And then you can characterize these materials. Uh, this shows, again, from New Gedix, uh, does ARPES, where they can see what the momentum and the spin of the electrons is. Uh, and then you can actually make a device out of it here. And then to see if what was originally predicted happened. One example is particularly nice is uh, um, Liang Fu suggested a particular crystal that would have very flat energy bands that would be good for vignal crystallization and the like. They had a particular structure that was a bit unstable, hard to grow, and then uh, Joe Chikelsky grew it, but then he couldn't tell with transport whether it was good or bad because you do a transport measurement, you get a big broad bump and it's like, what? Can't tell anything. But then we gave it to David Bell, and he, with the electron microscopes, they have enough resolution that you get a high resolution picture of exactly where the atoms are. And you can look directly what the crystal structure is, and you can tell which ones are the iron and which the selenium, because they have different sizes and the whole deal. And so it ends up being sort of a very uh, powerful uh, way of going about this. Um, one example, again, this comes from uh, Liang Fu. Uh, you would like to have a topological crystal where you can switch the topological part on and off. And it could just be a way to make a switch, or could it be to redirect things in another direction? And you'd like to do that in an easy way, say, with an electric field. And so by looking at a stack like this, they predicted that 12 layers, you just have an energy gap. This is K, and this is energy. 14 layers, this crossing, it means it's a topological insulator. But if you put an electric field on it, uh, then you turn it into a topological insulator. And he's had other ideas like that where you can use electric fields as a control to actually flip the topological properties to it. And so we made up our symbol. Here's the topological donut, and then there's the edge state. And I'm not sure that's a real IEEE symbol or not, but it's meant to be sort of a transition. Um, Sui Zhu Chang, if I'm saying this correctly, uh, just actually won an IUPAP International Award for sort of a brilliant uh, student this year. Uh, one reason is an experiment that's shown here. Uh, what people, he's working with uh, Jagadish Modera, they would like uh, the topological insulators are great because they have edge states, but the edge states go both directions. And so if you want to send information in only one direction, this is not necessarily a good thing because it's going backwards as well as forwards. And if you could make a ferromagnetic topological insulator, that problem goes away. And by sort of great, uh, in a totally homemade MBE machine, they managed to do that. Uh, and this shows the magnetic 
field here, and this shows the conduction signals uh, in a device, and it's ferromagnetic. It just sort of magnetization pops from one direction to the other as you go around this loop. And when you do that, the direction of the edge states flip directions from going counterclockwise to clockwise. Uh, and so it's again by sort of pushing, guided by theory and sort of pushing what you think is possible, you can uh, get here. Whoa. Why did it do that? Um, well, whatever, the computer didn't like that slide, so I guess we won't push it. Um, then the third area is Amir Jacobi, uh, and he's going after topologically protected uh, qubits. He's actually, Microsoft is putting real money into this. Yeah, go ahead. In the previous slide, the magnetic field, the ferromagnetic material, uh, that, that was essentially something that was synthesized as yeah, part that's of correct. the yeah. growth. Right. I see. And you have to, I forget, <laughs> some of these they put some yttrium in and you have to tune the, it's, it's hard, it's a, you know what you call a 24 hour job of trying to uh, adjust the alloy so it actually has good behavior. Um, but uh, the, really the end result is really quite good. Um, um, Amir um, is actually a friend of Michael Friedman. Michael Friedman is a prize-winning mathematician who runs the Center for Microsoft Station Q. It's really aimed at topological uh, quantum computing. But then he's a, he's a wonderful guy, but he's a mathematician. And the question is, how do you go from there to here? And so uh, Amir has been thinking about ways to really make that happen in the real world. Uh, and uh, this shows the... Uh, idea here, if you had a topological superconductor, uh, they can begin to do this. And so it's a combination of the different building blocks, uh, creating uh, edge states with uh, the device seen here, to testing topological superconductivity. And the thing about it that's really uh, exciting, controversial, and interesting is that there's something that's called a Majorana fermion. How many people know what Majorana fermion is? Um, good, about half. But uh, Majorana was a student working with Fermi, uh, and he invited, invented a, a fermion that its own uh, antiparticle. I'm not saying this the right way, am I? Um, and, but it's real, and uh, take the transform, it's also real. In high energy physics, uh, nobody ever saw it because it's just too hard to see. But it's predicted if you have a topological superconductor in the right geometry and the kind of thing that's shown here, you could actually see it. And so, Leo, I have to be careful what I say here. But it's, there's, uh, I'll leave the names out. But some people have claimed to uh, really see this and say that it's done and that it's all engineering now. And I asked their friends and they said, no, it hasn't been seen yet. But let me say it's a very hot field. And when uh, the discoveries have all been sort of ironed out, uh, that this is something that could be a very promising way to do topological uh, protection of, of qubits, and it's one of the drivers for the whole thing. Let me show you some things that have come out of this. Here's, I told you about a ferromagnetic uh, topological insulator, but that worked at sort of milligree temperatures. Uh, and Jagadish uh, Madera's group, they've uh, done a new version that actually works at room temperature, which is quite a big change. You know, if you're going to buy a CVS, it requires a dilution refrigerator. This is not good. And so this uh, bismuth selenide, which is classic uh, topological insulator, but they put it on a ferromagnetic uh, insulator, uh, europium sulfide. Uh, and it turns out it makes a magnetic interface, and if you do neutron scattering, you can actually look at the magnetization as a function of temperature, and it stays there all the way up to room temperature. And so doing the material science to actually figure out how to do things like this can have a huge effect on the interest of a company like Intel, for example, on uh, buying things like this. Uh, another one that uh, Hetton uh, and uh, Hart worked on was to make uh, topological superconductivity Again, by doing triplet pairing, we would take a superconductor uh, onto uh, graphene. Uh, and again, this is aimed at doing the uh, Majorana 
uh, in the right way and then developing these hybrid materials that go beyond what you see just in uh, graphene. And again, this is a very exciting area because when things work, it really has a big impact. It's not just you get 10 percent more or anything like that. Then the final area is uh, Marco uh, Lanchar. And Marco is a very easygoing guy, but he's quite something. When he made um, diamond nanowires, oh, back, gee, about six years ago, and we used them to help bring in the first five years of money. And it's a piece of single crystal diamond where you have all these beautiful nanowires coming up. And I asked Marco, who else can do this? And he said, well, uh, nobody else knows how to <laughs> do this or something like that. Now I think people do know. But in terms of fab, he goes, you know, really well beyond uh, the sphere of what mo people think is being uh, positive, possible. And this shows a, a few angles. I'll sort of spend some time and talk about some of them. This, uh, it turns out you can couple to NV centers in crystal and diamond. Uh, with strain, and so they actually made cantilevers in either to ca carry out that uh, experiment. Uh, you can also make a mixer where at 3 gigahertz or so you're using the NV centers as an RF mixer. And in fact, they made a RF receiver that's diamond, and it plays on the C's website where you can hear a radio station playing from your diamond crystal, which is sort of cute. Um, he has uh, ways of taking the other materials, uh, transition metal dyes, chalk iodonides, uh, to use them as photon detectors in an integrated structure where you have a diamond waveguide NV in the center and the photons actually get detected right there. And there's ways to take a diamond nanowire and then drape the transition metal dyed chalk iodonides over the top and it actually forms a quantum dot as a result of the strain right on top of the diamond, where again you're putting a device right on top of the, the color center that you want to see. And so this is sort of what I mean by quantum engineering. You use a lot of creativity uh, and work with the other people in the center to do some of these things. I'll show you uh, some of the earlier pictures of uh, things they've learned how to make with diamond photonics. All of these uh, start out with a single crystal of diamond. Uh, Marco, it turns out, has a close relationship with a big diamond grower, Element 6. Um, I actually had lunch with the Element 6 guy who was here to see Marco. And I asked the guy, what are you working on? And then he looked at me like this. And he didn't say a word. I said, oh, come on, man. You know, lighten up a bit. And, tell me. and he wouldn't say anything. It was like ultra secret. And so I asked Marco, and Marco told me. But uh, what they were doing was they sell diamond as being windows for ultra high power lasers. And if they put a, a quarter wavelength as the material on it, it gets blown off. And instead, Marco just put a little waffle iron on the side. So it's, it was a waffle iron made out of diamond. And then if you make the waffle correct, then you actually make anti-reflection coating. And then they saw the bunny, which was the guy was looking at when he didn't tell me. So he has really uh, good relationships with them. Let me show you something that's more fancy. Uh, right now they're working to make uh, a network that's actually on a chip. Uh, and it's getting pretty uh, sophisticated. This shows a, a series of resonators here. Uh, at the end, they taper the diamond down in such a way that you can take a tapered optical fiber and sort of match them up so that you actually send the light smoothly from one to the other. Uh, and then you can put a silicon vacancy center inside an optical cavity uh, here and then pop it with a, a laser to get things going. And so the process they are now is really figuring how do you actually wire up a chip so that you can get a functional uh, behavior in a quantum network as opposed to just de demonstrating that NV center works. And this is another a picture of an uh, optical resonator uh, with the silicon vacancy center right in the middle. This one was nice. We're trying to buy a machine in CNS to do this. In Sandia National Lab, they have an ion implanter. It's a focused ion beam uh, with silicon in it. And you just aim it at the middle here, and you go bleep, and then turn it on. 
and then blast some silicons right where you want them. And you can sort of write the pattern into the structure, and that's something that we're trying to do now. Any last questions? Actually, an old professor, I'm within 30 seconds of ending on the right time. That's a bad sign. Right? But good. Well, let me do some advertisement. Uh, every year we have a Frontiers for Quantum Materials and Device workshop. And uh, Pablo actually said, why, we're going to have it in Europe. And he says, why don't you have it in San Sebastian? And I never heard of Sebastian. So I'd ask you, Peck, said, San Sebastian, like that. And I say, OK, let's, let's check this out. And this is a picture of San Sebastian. Okay. And I saw this, and I, my, I said, this looks OK. And it's in the Basque country. And there's the castle, the, the queen in the uh, late 18th, 19th century, uh, decided she didn't like the king very much. And so she wanted another castle, which is on the beach. Okay? And so being that you're the queen, you can actually do this. So they build a castle. Here it is, Palacio Miramar, which means you can see the sea. Uh, it's right here. And that's where the conference is going to be. And so over Christmas, I went to visit this place. It turns out there's also the highest density of Michelin starred restaurants per capita is in the whole world is in San Sebastian. Okay. So we went, we checked this out, and we stayed in the Hotel Maria Cristina, which was truly nice, uh, and then visited the, uh, the palace, and it's just gorgeous. Uh, the room is actually paneled like this, only sadly it looks a lot better than this, and uh, has windows where you can look at the ocean. Underneath it, there's a big uh, porch and then a, like a cocktail room for the uh, posters, and it's really nice. Uh, so in addition, we use this to bring in the speakers, and this is sort of an outstanding uh, group of speakers in the field. It goes between Diamond. We got Leo Kallenhofen, for example. We have three Max Planck Institute directors. Uh, and so this is going to be a very nice uh, event, and we're just starting to advertise this now. So by all means, uh, come, enjoy the, they call them pictos, I think. They have things like grilled foie gras, snackies for like $9, and things like that. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. Okay, well, thank you very much. So questions any of any sort? Okay, well, if you want to, uh, if you want to sign up for the course of the next lecture, lecture, next seminar is by Marco Lanchar. He's really a great speaker. I think that'll, will be a lot of new stuff in there. Uh, and then please uh, sign up here. Uh, and, uh,